This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So my old friend, uh, Don Verley, uh, accomplished lawyer and now Solicitor General of the United States, thank you for coming to Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm really enjoying my uh, Don Verley is not only one of the most interesting lawyers in the world, but one of the most influential lawyers uh, in the world because the position of Solicitor General of the United States, established in 1870, requires first that he be learned in the law. Uh, and he helps shape and then presents the legal positions of the United States to federal courts around the country, and most particularly the United States Supreme Court. Uh, my understanding is that General Varelli has argued 21 cases since becoming the Solicitor General, yep. quite a number in two and a half years. Uh, and the uh, Solicitor General's office itself has less than 30 lawyers, some 25 lawyers, uh, and is viewed as perhaps the most powerful law firm in the country. Uh, it's certainly a small firm. <laughs> so I want to start with the Supreme Court case that uh, some people may recall having to do with something called the Affordable Health Care Act. Uh, which, uh, to summarize, uh, was argued over three days, I believe, which is, I think, the longest set of arguments since at least Brown versus Board of Education uh, in the Supreme Court. And by dint of the social media and the instantaneous legal commentary, I think an unprecedented amount of attention was put on this case and the arguments. And if you, you'll remember that in return for extending medical coverage to millions of people previously uncovered, the law required almost everyone in America to purchase purchase a minimum health care policy or make a large payment to the government. So the question goes like this. Just after noon on Tuesday, March 27th, 2012, you, Don Varelli, ended an exhausting set of arguments, uh, well over four hours of oral argument, by saying this to the assembled justices of the Supreme Court. Here's a quote. I urge this court to uphold the minimum coverage provision of the Affordable Health Care Act as an exercise of the taxing power. That was his final sentence. Some observers were immediately critical of your presentation over these uh, days of oral argument. And then three months later, the justices did exactly what you asked them to do. So my question is, what are your thoughts on the matter <laughs> two years later? So, you know, it was, uh, first of all, it is, it's wonderful to be here and uh, very grateful to all of you for taking the time to come out and uh, be with us this afternoon. Um, and with respect to the case, you know, uh, I felt this at the time. I feel it even more acutely now, looking back on it, uh, perhaps even more acutely because we prevailed. But uh, that it was, I think, the great privilege of my legal career to be able to be the lawyer for the United States arguing that case. It was a case of great consequence and, and on many different levels. and. Uh, it was one of the rare cases, at least in my lifetime, in which the entire public of the country seemed to be deeply engaged in the case and the process and what the court was doing. And uh, to have been a part of that was just an amazing, amazing experience, impossible to replicate. And uh, it was actually, the, th the case was argued Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and it was the, the Wednesday the 28th when we were done. It was after the Medicaid argument, and I tried to do a, a uh, closing that summarized the sort of themes of the whole case on the, at the end of it on Wednesday uh, to try and the, and the thought I wanted to leave with them was not so much the specific thought that uh, the tax power argument was a good argument but the more general thought that you know this was a 
statute of enormous consequence that Congress had struggled about a century before it was able to enact, and that uh, it represented the will of the uh, democratically elected uh, branches of government, and that that was something that ought to weigh very heavily on the court in thinking about its uh, the court's role, um, and that because there was a way to construe the statute uh, to make it constitutional as an exercise of the tax power, that it really was, I think I use words like this, that it was the obligation of the court to construe it in that way in order to respect the fundamental democratic principles that are embedded in our Constitution. And uh, fortunately enough, that view prevailed. But I think, you know, the, to me at least, the most interesting thing about the oral arguments in that case was that, to my mind, and this was true at the time, this is now especially true looking back on it, the most important day of the three was actually the first day, Monday, where we were arguing what to, to the whole world looked like a very dry, abstruse question of jurisdiction about whether a statute called the Anti-Injunction Act precluded federal courts from hearing this case um, on the ground that it was a challenge to a tax. And uh, the Anti-Injunction Act says if you want to challenge a tax, you have to first pay the tax and then seek a refund and challenge in that context when your refund is denied. And the, the reason I thought it was so important the first day was not so much because of the Anti-Injunction Act specifically, but we um, were able on that first day to do a lot of work in the case that proved, I think, to be decisive. Not that it, the oral argument had this inf effect. It may have well have been in their minds beforehand. But you know, the key to winning on the tax power argument was to separate out the requirement in the law that said you had to have insurance from the requirement in the law that said you paid a tax if you didn't have insurance. And that the position that the United States decided to take in interpreting the statute was that the requirement that you had to have insurance was nothing more than a predicate to the obligation to pay the tax if you didn't. In other words, if you didn't get insurance, no legal consequence flowed from that other than an obligation to pay a tax. And that, you know, it's a funny thing. If you go back and look at the transcript of Monday's argument, this dry, abstruse argument about this jurisdictional issue, you'll see that about half of the argument was actually spent on that question about whether the mandate was separate from the tax or not. And I had realized fairly early on in the argument that the court was going to be okay with concluding that the Anti-Injunction Act wasn't a bar to hearing the case now, which was the position the United States was advocating. So I actually did make a decision to focus a lot of the argument time on this question of treating the uh, obligation to have insurance separately from the tax and, the, and trying to stress the point that there was no legal obligation and no legal duty flowing from not having insurance other than paying a tax if you didn't have it. And I do think that if you sort of look in the opinion, the Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, you'll see it's there. And I do think that was actually the fulcrum on which the case turned. And virtually no one in America was paying attention to what was happening. So it was really it's kind of an interesting thing about the way the process unfolds. Well, and I have this memory that the Chief Justice, I think, started either Tuesday or, or, or possibly Wednesday on asking the question, well, wait a minute, you say it's not a tax for the Anti-Injunction Acts, and you say it is a tax for the power that of That was Justice Alito, and that was actually okay. about 90 seconds into my argument on Monday. So <laughs> he said, said, today you're telling me it's not a tax, tomorrow well, you're you telling me it's off. a tax. So. <laughs> and, and recently, I mean, the work of the, the Solicitor General never stops, and I think it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about how much work you do that isn't presenting oral arguments in the, in the court, but before you do that, recently you argue this recess appointments case. And you argued another case, uh, something like seven days later. Uh, how do you do two Supreme Court arguments in one week? Well, uh, they were in separate weeks. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 I think the best way to answer that question is to talk a little bit, actually, about the way my office works. Uh, you know, as Rory said, it's a very small place. We have, uh, there's one SG and there are four deputies, uh, three of whom are career employees there, you know, have been there a very long time, extraordinary repository of, of, intell of uh, intellectual talent and institutional memory. 
uh, and then one uh, principal deputy who's also a political appointee, and then 16 assistants who are younger lawyers who are also career employees. And then we have four lawyers called Bristol Fellows who are there for one year. And so we do have 25 lawyers and another 20 or so support staff. So that's about, what, 45 people. Our total budget's about $10 million, uh, which for those of you who are in or have been in the private sector know that'll buy you about three pieces of litigation in the private sector. And so but here's what you get uh, as a taxpayer in America for that $10 million. You get 30 cases more or less briefed and argued in the Supreme Court every year, 30 more cases more or less uh, briefed and argued as amicus in the Supreme Court, 10 or so cert petitions, 2,000 or so briefs in opposition. And like then, two two thousand yeah, briefs in yeah, opposition. Yeah, and then, underline that. And then you know when the United States loses a case in the trial court, by law the Solicitor General has to approve before the United States can appeal. And the United States, believe it or not, loses about two thousand cases a year. And so we have to make two thousand decisions a year about whether to appeal. And those are actually not rubber stamp things at all. So those of you in the audience who participate in the process know there's a very rigorous process. The, the entity in the government that wants an appeal has to write a memo, and then it comes to our office, and a lot of analysis goes into it, so all that work gets done. Uh, so it's just a, a small number of people doing a huge amount of work. And one of the things that they do incredibly effectively is help me get ready for oral argument. And the, I have much less time to spend getting ready for arguments than I did when I was in the private sector. It's just the nature of the job. People think that, well, you're the SG, and the public face of the job is that that's the person up at the podium. But you know, really, that's only a very small part of the job. And it's not one that I can afford to spend a huge amount of time on. And, but that's offset by the help I get. And the one main way that happens is through the moot court process. We always do two moot courts for each argument. Uh, I do that, deputies, assistants, that's our office rule. And the assistants, the younger lawyers, there'll be four or five of them doing the moot court. They'll put a huge amount of work into it. The deputy will be there, and then other lawyers in the executive branch will be there. And we go at it for about two hours, about an hour of Q&A, an hour of discussion afterwards. And in, the, in between the two moot courts, I find that about 90% of the questions I get asked at oral argument have been asked me at the moot courts. Sometimes ex in exactly the same words that they get asked at, at argument itself. It's a little unnerving, actually, when that happens. But it does happen with some frequency. And even more than that, the lawyers in my office, they just understand the justices, and they understand how they think. And so they understand what's going to be important to the justices about a particular case. And so. I can be a much, much more efficient when I'm able to be supported in that kind of a way in terms of getting ready. And then I'm going to tell a story. For those of you who have been in other things I've been in today, this will probably be the third time you've heard it, but I'll <laughs> tell it again anyway. I apologize. I can also draw on uh, the expertise of the executive branch to help me get ready. There was one case I did last year, which was a really interesting case. It was a patent case about whether you could get a patent on a human gene that had been extracted from the body. And the United States was taking the position in that case that you shouldn't allow patents on human, isolated human genes. And the case was really about science much more than law. That the, the legal conclusion flowed from the understanding of the science in the case. And the last science I had done was more or less as a sophomore in high school. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so I was really in a deep hole. But one thing you can do in the executive branch, and I have a job like mine, I was able to uh, call up the head of the National Institutes of Health, a man named Francis Collins, and if you know who he is. But before he was head of the uh, National Institutes of Health, he ran the Human Genome Project. So that was a man who knew something about genetics. And so I called and said, you know, Francis, can you come to my moot courts, please? And so he came to my moot courts. And then even more uh, helpful, he arranged um, to have three really brilliant scientists from NIH come down to my office with a whiteboard and give me a tutorial on genetics. And you know, we spent a couple hours just teaching me the genetics. And then another hour, they really helped me shape what I was going to say in arguments so that it was both conveyed in a common sense way that the justices would be able to understand, but it was also scrupulously faithful to the scientist, to the, to the science, being accurate scientifically. And you know, and I had been in the private sector, I don't know, I'd probably taken 40 hours or more to get to the same place. And so, so that's one way in which I can be, uh, I get so much incredible help that it, you know, you can be a lot more efficient when you do that. 
That's great. That's a great story. I have to ask you the gee whiz question that some people, I think, always want to ask, but it sounds like People Magazine. Uh, have you hung out with the president? <laughs> <laughs> Do you play golf with Barack Obama? Or, you know, no. and I know you work in the White House, but I mean, officially, your job is to help shape the position of the United States. Yeah. Uh, what sort of interaction is there between your office or you and the president? We haven't played golf. Um, and, you know, there is a, the office has a, by very long tradition, uh, it has an ethic of independence, meaning that the judgment that um, a solicitor general and the lawyers in the solicitor general's office should make about what to do in a case is a judgment that ought to be driven by what's in the long-term interest of the United States institutionally. And that's a very complex judgment and involves getting a lot of inputs because the executive branch of the United States government is a, is a very complicated thing. And there are a lot of, of uh, different perspectives in it. And you know, and and the one thing that we do not do, and there would be just a catastrophe within the office if an SG ever did, is to make decisions for partisan political reasons. Um, so there is a tradition of independence. Now, one thing you have to do as SG is balance that against the reality that you are an officer in the executive branch of the government, and you know, by law. The, the, the authority that I have is actually authority that has been delegated formally in a regulation from the Attorney General to the Solicitor General. Congress passed a statute giving the Attorney General certain powers, and the Attorney General then issued regulations a long time ago that allocate those powers, delegate them to various entities within the Justice Department, and there's a regulation that allocates to the SG the authority to represent the United States in court, decide when the United States will be an amicus, uh, and in any court and to approve appeals, a process I described before. So it is, I'm really exercising authority that is delegated from the Attorney General and therefore the Attorney General can supervise and of course we all work for the President. So as a formal matter, I'm an executive branch official and responsible to the Attorney General, responsible to the President. Now the, what I have experienced, um, something that uh, one of my predecessors, Walter Dellinger, a wonderful lawyer and a wonderful human being, predicted would be true and has turned out to be true. He said to me that the fact that I had worked in the White House before coming over to the SG position would end up giving me more independence than most SGs had from the White House. And that, I think, has proven to be quite true. And the reason is because, you know, and, and there was some concern. I, I recognized that when I first got nominated, some people said, well, geez, this is unusual to have somebody come from the White House to the SG position. And it was unusual. But, um, but Walter turned out to be exactly right in what he said, in that the main thing, in my experience, that people at the White House worry about is that somebody out in the vast reaches of an administration, the executive branch, is going to do something that's really stupid and <laughs> cause a catastrophe that will catch the White House unawares. And that, and then, so a lot of the, what you might call oversight or outreach that the White House does is just to make sure that the, they don't get surprised in a negative way. And I think, and that I don't know that this is true, but it's, I think it's kind of worked out this way, that they just don't do that with me. And I think the reason is because I spent a year and a half with them, I work with them very closely, and I don't know if any of you have been in the White House or taken a tour of it or whatever, it's a really small place, and I mean really small, and everybody is like crammed in there, and everybody's in everybody else's business all the time just because of the physical proximity, so you really get to know people. And I just think that they were comfortable with me, um, and so I think they were comfortable that I wasn't likely to drive them off a cliff in, in a way that would surprise them, you know? And so, as a result, they basically left me alone, and the interactions that we have generally with the White House are, you know, me giving them a heads up, you know, I'm planning to take this position in this case, just want you to know. And even that is a very, very tiny fraction of the cases. I mean, in truth, most cases, the positions that we would take on behalf of the United States would be the same no matter who was president, no matter which, uh, which political party was in charge of the executive branch. A lot of the stuff is just institutional stuff. What are we going to say about a Bivens case? What are we going to do about this interpretation of this criminal statute? That's really the bed, bed, bread and butter work of the office. and it doesn't change much from administration to administration. 
So I think sometimes people, uh, when they see someone in your position in the executive branch, uh, forget that you had any history before that. That you are a representative of the government, for better or worse, and out here in California we have, uh, San Francisco in particular, a deep suspicion of the government. Um, so I sort of want to talk a little bit about what you did in private practice, although I do also have some gee whiz questions like how often do you hang out with the Supreme Court justices at, yeah. at parties and things, but you were a partner at a major national law firm for over two decades, I think, yeah. and two cases come to my mind when I think of what you did in that 20-year uh, history. One is um, a case called Grokster which some of you file sharing uh, music uh, owning students uh, may be familiar with. Um, and you, had a, you, had, you represented a, 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 a sort of a high tech case. And then the other is a case called Wiggins versus Smith, which is a habeas corpus case in the capital uh, death penalty context. And I look at Grokster and Wiggins and now what you're doing and I think that is really a very diverse subject uh, matter. I mean that is as diverse as you can get. So, Tell us a little bit about what it was like to be in practice, you know, with Jenner and Block and, and do both some pro bono work at the highest level, these are both Supreme Court cases, and sort of this corporate, uh, you know, high tech stuff. Yeah, so, it, you know, it, there's actually a lot less diversity of subject matter when I was in private practice than now. I mean, one of the amazing, wonderful things about the job I have now is that you go from arguing about the constitutionality of recess appointments to questions about how the First Amendment interacts with labor law to you know questions about campaign finance. It's just, I mean, it's amazing. It's just amazing diversity. And when I was in private practice, it was more, I, I wasn't exactly a specialist, but I did tend to focus on certain areas, telecommunications for a while and digital copyright for a while. and. I was very fortunate that I got to, you know, cases came my way that I got to do that turned out to be quite significant cases. Grokster was one of them. I represented the copyright owners in that case. Um, and uh, my daughter, uh, who's now a senior in college, was, I guess, in high school then, or junior high school, and I certainly um, didn't win her any friends. <laughs> the competition I was taking in that case. and. Uh, and uh, and you know and I didn't win a lot of friends for myself either. As a matter of fact, uh, but it was a wonderful, interesting case to be able to do kind of sort of a, a case about a brand new technology and how the these uh, well-established uh, doctrines and principles of the law would adapt or not adapt to a vast change in technology and how the law would be made to fit. Uh, something that the drafters of the law could never have conceived of, you know, it was really interesting. And then the death penalty stuff was just kind of separate. You know, I did a fair number as a pro bono matter of capital punishment cases when I was in the firm. And I thought that it would be a good way to use my time doing pro bono matters because I felt back from the time when we were clerking really that there was a crying need for effective representation of people who were facing death sentences and that one thing I could do was maybe devote some of my time to helping ameliorate that in some small way. And then it, as it turned out, a lot of the cases I ended up doing were cases that involved questions about Sixth Amendment right to counsel, effective assistance of counsel, and one of them was this case, Wiggins, uh, where I actually started representing the guy um, about ten years before the case got to the Supreme Court. Uh, someone asked me to take it on when it was in state habeas corpus proceedings. They had just been convicted and sentenced to death. And I took the case on and did the state habeas corpus trial. And that process took a few years. And then the state Supreme Court appeal and that process took a few years. And the federal habeas case and the Fourth Circuit. And then that took was a ten-year odyssey. And we actually lost the case in the Fourth Circuit. We had won it in the trial, federal trial court, and then we lost in the Tenth Circuit, and I sort of thought that was the end of the road, but um, miraculously, the, the court decided to grant our petition for certiorari, and ended up being a case where we found the court, we had seven votes for the proposition that uh, our client had received ineffective assistance of counsel in capital sentencing, which was, I don't know, quite a remarkable thing. It was another one of those things in my career that I'm really, really grateful I had a chance to do. So you've been a trial lawyer. 
I wouldn't carry. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> really. I don't think it would be wise to hire me to be a trial lawyer in most circumstances. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go back and, and do a little fun uh, memory lane stuff. So I met uh, Don. Uh, you and I met at a, on a hot Washington, D.C. August okay. day clerking uh, at the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. Uh, we ended up I'm quite grateful that we ended up working together for this guy who I always called Mr. Justice, and we also called him the boss, and it wasn't Bruce Springsteen. Uh, it was uh, Justice William Brennan. What, what, what memories do you hold from that? What sticks out in your mind from that year? Well, you know, I, it's not, not, nothing actually specific, aside from the you know, extraordinary privilege of working with you, Robert. <laughs> but, um, but Don saved me from error. Yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> You know, uh, in my experience of Justice Brennan was that you know, people have these great reputations, and then when you m meet them up close, you know, not everybody lives up to the reputation they have. But Justice Brennan, it was the opposite. He, I thought, you know, he had this wonderful reputation, and actually up close, he was even better than his reputation. He was just a wonderful, amazing human being, and getting to spend a year in his presence was really a great, great thing. I'm really grateful for that. You know, as you remember, we would have those morning meetings. Justice Brennan would not uh, require us to write bench memos on cases, as most law clerks have to do uh, for their judges or justices. Instead, he would gather us all together every morning over coffee and have us talk about the cases with him. And each law clerk would be have the principal responsibility to present on that case and would present the case and, and offer suggestions about how it ought to be analyzed and the other law clerks would chip in and the justice would interact with us. And it really was quite remarkable. We got to spend a couple of hours every single day doing this with him. It was really, really amazing experience. So that's sort of how I remember it. Not so much any specific thing, but just that the, the wonderful quality of the overall experience. And, and do you remember in April of 1985, we had a birthday party for Justice Brown? Yeah, 79th birthday, yeah. 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 What, were, what were you wearing that day? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Why, do you know? <laughs> I'm talking about the hats. Oh, the hats. Yeah, we had those stupid, silly hats on. That's right. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't all just uh, library work. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. So now, and I'm getting a little personal here, but the year that we were clerking, you were dating a woman named Gail Lasker. Uh, lovely woman, African American, young lawyer. Uh, are you still in touch with Gail? <laughs> yes, we've been married now 25 plus years. <laughs> that was a sign, Roy, about that question. <laughs> 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 I didn't prep yeah. that one with him. Yeah, no, we've been married 25 years. And, uh, we weren't married at the time then, but uh, we, we met at college, and we didn't go to the same law school, but we were both in New York, and we've been married 25 wonderful years. And but she's a lawyer. Going, and she's a lawyer, too, yeah. Okay. Had a great Washington career, done all kinds of great things. General Counsel of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, head of legal affairs for the, the Legal Services Corporation, worked for Barney Frank, worked for Howard Metzenbaum. Now she's the head of consumer affairs at the National Credit Union Administration. And, uh, so she's had a more different career than mine. You know, as, as I sort of just did one thing all along, she's done different things, which is one of the great things about a law degree, the ability to jump around and do different things. Does she critique what you do now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not in a way I'm going to discuss. <laughs> so, no. Very, very wise. But very it's good. Wise. You, need, you, you need somebody that would be able to tell you when you've really, you know, right. done something stupid. And so <laughs> so uh, here's, a, here's a question that's more law school oriented. Um, everybody in this law school has got to take moot court at some point. Um, they all are, pretend to be arguing. What, what, you may have done this already with the moot court people. What, what tips would you give young lawyers in terms of um, how, to, how to argue a case or what do you do? Yeah, you know, I get asked that a lot. And there, I don't think there's any really uh, great advice to give, uh, except at a very high level of generality. But I think this advice is, has some value, and, and even though it's at a high level of generality. To me, the most important thing when you're an oral advocate is to be who you are, be yourself. Don't try to mimic somebody else's style of advocacy. Be an advocate who talks to the judges or justices in the way that you talk to people, because that's when you're going to be at your most effective, it's gonna, when it's the most natural, when it's coming out of your mouth in your own voice naturally. And that means different things for different people. Some people are really more like, you know, super caffeinated, and that, that can be very effective. Some people are more thoughtful, and that can be very effective. Everybody has a different 
style, different approach as a human being interacting with other human beings. And that's what you're doing in an oral argument is you're interacting with the judges or justices in a human way. I mean, people call it a conversation. And I would say it is conversational. It's not really what normal people think of as a conversation. <laughs> but, um, but, it, it, but you know, it's, it's, you, you, it does reinforce this idea you should be yourself and talk to yourself. And, you know, so, so that, and then the other thing that I think is really, really important and that it's the right thing to do and also makes you more effective is to act with integrity. You know, just that, just that integrity matters a lot. That you know, being candid about things that are unhelpful to your case when you, when when, when they are unhelpful to your case, is a good thing. It, should, it will help you. And having that, you know, having that sense of integrity, saying, you know, being a, f a fierce advocate for your position, but faithful to what the law is and what the facts are, and and understanding that you need the justices or the judges to trust what you are saying to them. And if they find that you are saying to them, things to them over time that don't match up with what they then go back and read or what they've already read, you're going to undermine your ability to be effective. And so I guess those two things, you know, be talk in your own voice and act with integrity. You do those two things, you're likely to be very effective. Right. And another story that I think can speak to students sometimes is the story of how you got your first clerkship, uh, not with yeah. Justice Brennan, but with Judge Skelly Wright. Now, people here may not remember Skelly Wright, but he was a giant on the D.C. Circuit at the time. Yeah, so this is a story about the role of chance in life and luck and how it can really affect your life. And it sort of also helps you understand why you know, to always be grateful for the things you get to do. Um, that that because chance and luck, as much as dessert, uh, uh, dictates how things unfold. So I was a second-year law student, and I had taken constitutional law in the fall of my second year in law school uh, from a, a terrific constitutional law professor named Benno Schmidt, who went on to become dean of Columbia Law School and then president of Yale, and then has gone on and done other things. And um, so I had done well in, in Professor Smith's constitutional law class in the fall of my second year. And then spring of second year rolls around, and it's time. I don't know when people apply for clerkships now, but at that point you apply for them like in February or March of your second year in law school. And the choices were all made March, April of your second year in law school. And so I was getting ready to apply for clerkships. and. Uh, I want to need recommendations, and so I went to see Professor Sh Professor Schmidt for a recommendation, and I went into his office and knocked on his door, and he was at his desk, and he said, well, hello, son, can I help you? And I said, yes, I'm Don Verrilli, and I was in your con law class, and I was hoping you might write a clerkship recommendation for me. And he said, well, what grade did you get? And I said, well, I got an A. And then he said, well, was it a good A? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I wouldn't know, would I? <laughs> and he said, wait a minute. And then he, pulls, he opens a drawer and he pulls out this list from the drawer. And he says, yeah, it was a good A. And, and I said, well, so would you write me a recommendation? And he said, sure, you got a good A. And, um, and uh, he said, well, where are you applying? Uh, and I said, well, I want to apply to the following judges, uh, mostly on the D.C. Circuit. And I listed off a number of judges. And I said, and Jay Skelly Wright. And then he, and he said, son, let me interrupt you. Um, Jay Skelly Wright, do you, you have any idea who Jay Skelly Wright is? You know, he only picks the editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal and the Harvard Law Review and the Stanford Law Journal. The only hope you would ever have of uh, getting clerkship from him is if you were editor-in-chief of the Law Review. I said, well, I am. <laughs> and, and, then, and then he said, oh, well, geez, I, I thought you were editor-in-chief of this other journal, the Journal of Law and Social Problems. And I said, no. Um, the person who's editor-in-chief of that does have an Italian last name, but her name is Barbara Brizzi. And at this point, he was utterly mortified. And so I, I'm quite sure just in you know, in, in reaction to his feelings of embarrassment, he got, throws it in a high gear and he says, I'm going to call Judge Wright right now. <laughs> and sure enough, I'm standing there, he picks up the phone and he calls Judge Wright and he gets Judge Wright and he does this sales job and I get the clerkship. And, and the whole reason I got this clerkship is because 
Ben Schmidt was embarrassed. <laughs> so, I mean, really, I, you know, and I've told this story many times. I've told it in his presence, and you know, and, and, uh, and I don't think he denies it actually. <laughs> so, but it does show the value of uh, random of luck, of chance. Right, moments. it's really true. Right. It's really true. Um, so I want to go back maybe to sort of law topics in some sense. Uh, when you argued the recess appointments case, um, that was a constitutional case for which there was no real constitutional precedent uh, from the Supreme Court, wide open field in some sense. And so my question is a more general one, which is, have you, uh, you, you were a lawyer for a long time, you argued some pretty important cases, you clerked the Supreme Court, has your understanding of the Constitution or your understanding of the constitutional interpretive exercise uh, changed in the last two and a half years? Have, uh, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, I, what I would say about that is that I spend a huge amount of my time now working on things that I didn't actually think about a huge amount in private practice. N most of the cases I do, many of the cases our office does, and most of the cases I do tend to be cases about the allocation of power. The allocation of power between the federal government and the states and the allocation of power within the federal government among the branches. And, you know, recess appointments is a perfect example of the latter, and the health care case, and numerous others are examples of the former. And so those are things, so I, I guess rather than say that my view has changed, that the, I, I had not spent enough time as a lawyer thinking about the fundamental significance of the questions of allocation of power within our system. And that is now what I think about predominantly and I spend a lot of time now thinking about how to think about mm -hmm. those questions uh, and, and, and to what extent are you making arguments that are really focused in the text, to what extent are you making structural arguments, what role does history play, and you know, all, all of those arguments, all those questions have a bearing on both sets of power allocation issues, but I spend a lot of time thinking about those issues now. And as you're developing a brief on a, in a case like that, what, what is the process within your office? I mean, I assume you're working from memos produced by other lawyers in the department. Uh, how does that end up in the final product? Yeah, it took, I, you know, there's a fixed way in which we do uh, the briefs in, the, in, in our cases. And it basically runs like this. The, the Supreme Court grants cert in a case where the United States is a party the uh, division in the Justice Department that has been handling the case, or if it hasn't been handled in the Justice Department and instead of an agency, the agency that's been handling the case, will do a first draft of the brief. And that will be done and then uh, come to the office. And the assistant in the office will get the draft and then will work on it and then circulate it back to the original authors and get reactions to the initial edits. And then that will go to a deputy, and the deputy will work on it. And uh, the deputy will edit it, again, recirculate it to the group, get everybody comfortable, and then it will hit the SG's desk at some point. And the basic rule that we have is that I get the brief four days before it's due. So in many cases, the, when I get a brief four days before it's due, when it, in a case where I get a brief four days before it's due, and especially if it's a subject I haven't been focused on, there's not a whole lot that's going to happen in those four days. You know, and in fact, it would be probably make matters worse if I tried to really dig in too aggressively. And very often, I might have more than one brief on the same timetable. And so for lots of briefs, not a whole lot uh, of, of my own input goes into it. But the approach I've taken, based on advice that some of my distinguished predecessors have given me, is to sort of figure out at the beginning uh, what are going to be the really important cases. And they might not all be cases I argue, but you know, pick out the 10 most important cases for each term and really focus on those. And that's what I have tried to do. So on those, I approach it differently. On those, I try to, that process runs exactly the same, but I try to get myself involved much earlier in the process, go to meetings with the lawyers, have discussions about what our position ought to be, look at the initial draft when it comes in so I can give an initial reaction to it, and then be much more involved. And then I try to change the schedule so I get the brief earlier. So I have a chance to edit it, you know, two, three times before it goes in. When I was in the private sector, 
I was kind of an obsessive editor. I might edit a brief 10 or 15 times, you know, before I, I would send it. I can't possibly do that now, but at least to be able to take two or three cracks at something that really matters. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I will try to do that. Do you find yourself doing style editing? I mean, are you, are you, or do you pretty much try to? Well, you know, the SG's office, those of you who've read SG briefs, there's sort of an SG style. <laughs> and and it's a little, for me personally, it's a little more subdued than I would be if it were just me. So I sometimes try to juice it up a little bit, but then, <laughs> then the deputies come back and they say, we can't do that, we can't say that. And then we work out some compromise that's a little more juiced up than what they had and not where I had initially edited it. And are the briefs produced right there in the Department of Justice? I don't know where they print them, but they yeah. print them somewhere. Is it I, a fire drill at the end, like it, it can be in private practice? Is it, you know, 10 o'clock at night? And Everything goes down to the wire, yeah. I mean, you gotta remember, as I said, we have, this very small number of lawyers doing this staggering amount of work. And if you, you notice when I discussed it, we have, an, on all but the very, very biggest cases, we have one assistant and one deputy, and that's it in the SG. You know, it's not like in a private firm where you might have four, five, six people on the team. You've got one assistant and one deputy. And of course, all the people backing them up, the people in the divisions and the agencies and whatnot. But within our office, it's very, very, very thinly staffed because it just needs to be because there's so much work. Well, when I take that 2,000 uh, appeal recommendation figure, which you have to sign off on, and you divide it by how many working days there are in a year. If I say I work 300 days, that's like six or seven a day. Maybe. Six or seven yeah. a day where you're deciding whether the United States' interest is to appeal or not. Yeah, that gets easier over time because once you've been there two, three terms, you know, you start to see the same issues over and over again and you kind of know what the United States position is on that issue and so you don't have to spend as much time digging in. So that's gotten a little easier, but it's still, you know, it's not a, it's one of the things, again, I, 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 as I said, earlier, you know, the American taxpayer gets this unbelievable amount of work for an uh, extremely small amount of money. But in addition to getting the unbelievable quantity of work, the level of commitment that people show is really amazing. That like these appeal recommendations are really, you know, some of you probably have been involved and have seen them or written them, and, and they're really serious work. They're, these very serious, lengthy memos, very carefully thought through, and then very careful commentary by the lawyers along the chain as it gets to my office. And you know, it's really remarkable, remarkable how much effort people put in and something that could easily just turn into a rubber stamp and doesn't at all. And uh, let me ask you one more question about that process uh, because when I was familiar with it, which was some time ago, the SG also had to spend time having a meeting with, for example, the U.S. attorney from the district who had an interest in that case, or possibly the private lawyer who had an interest. They're trying to influence your decision one way or the other. Do you also do that? Um, some. You know, the, the basically, you know, if we're going to do what they want, we don't meet. Right. We don't need to meet. <laughs> so it's basically only going to meet if, they're, if you're disinclined to do what the, either the U.S. attorney or the head of the agency or whatever is asking you to do. And in that circumstance, you basically the deputy's job is to ask whether they want a meeting and, or a phone call, sometimes just a phone call. And you know, most of the time the answer to that question is no, but sometimes the answer to that question is yes, and whenever, they, the, you know, whenever that an the answer is yes, then I'll either have a meeting or a phone call. And I feel like it's part of the reason I say this is a serious process is I feel like I need to be able in that meeting or in that phone call to personally explain in a cogent way why it's, we don't think it's a good idea to do what that person wants us to do. And so that requires an investment by everybody else in the chain and then some investment of time by me to make sure I understand the case well enough that I can cogently explain why we're going to take a different path. And and I, just, you know, I feel like I sort of owe that to the people in the process to be able to do that. So, so it's a seven day a week job? Well, from, I would say from Labor Day to Memorial Day, it's a seven day a week job. You know, maybe a little time off in the holidays, but the summers are really pretty calm. You know, the court doesn't grant, for some reason, they don't grant a whole lot of cases in this next 90 day time frame so that we don't tend to have a whole lot of briefs due in May, June, July. And because those are cases for the next year, Usually you can negotiate extensions, and so we don't, the arguments end at the end of April. We have a very busy month of May because the court asks for our views about wh whether search should be granted on you know, 10, 15, 20 cases a year. And we, there's no deadline on those, and we're just too busy to make much progress on them until the arguments are over at the end of April, so we scramble like mad in May to try to get those done, as many as we can. 
But then you get to Memorial Day, and the months of June and July, there really is not a whole lot of work in the office, and so the lawyers tend to really kind of kick it back, you know, go into first gear, don't work so hard, and that's really important because they do just go flat out for that eight, nine month stretch, and so. And at the end of the term, there's opinions announced. Are you, do you go? Are you, oh yeah. Were oh, you yeah. there for the Affordable Health Care Act? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, we sit at council table for all the hand downs of the opinions, yeah. And do you, do you uh, keep your poker face, or do you? Yeah, it's important <laughs> to do that, you know, so. <laughs> be, that would not be a good idea, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, betray any unhappiness. Well, so, so let me ask another question. Uh, we're going to get close to the end of our time about another part of the process that probably wasn't very happy, which is your confirmation process. Yeah. What, what was that like? I mean, a, a, and I have some specific questions about it, but I mean, overall. Well, you know, the Senate is entitled under the Constitution to exercise its advice and consent function for this job and for lots of others. And they do so, and they have a right to ask whatever they want, and uh, and um, you know, and uh, I, I have an obligation to do my best to answer all their questions. You know, that having been said, it's not a lot of fun to go through. I don't think anybody in the modern era thinks it's a lot of fun to go through. And um, I found it challenging for myself because it's quite a different experience than being an oral advocate, because it's a different. It's just a different process. Things kind of come at you in funny angles and people are trying to make points. You may not understand exactly what point they're trying to make with the question they're asking you and it's a, often a point that you know, is not necessarily about you. you know. And so it's, I found it to be a highly, highly challenging. Well, that process. was really true in your case. Questions that weren't about you? Well, they asked a lot. My confirmation hearing turned into mostly discussion about the decision of the executive branch not to continue to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. That decision was made by the President and the Attorney General shortly before the time of my confirmation hearing. Uh, and I got asked quite a few questions about that. And in fact, you know, I, I think probably the majority of the questions in my hearing were about that. The irony of it was that I had been recused from the process of making that decision because my former law firm had participated in litigating these cases and um, by the administration's ethics rules, you had to stay out for two years of any matter that your former employer was involved in. So I was, didn't have anything to do with the decisions. Um, but they had been publicly announced shortly before my hearing, so my hearing became an opportunity for the senators who were unhappy about the decisions to express their unhappiness. And I just happened to be the person at whom they expressed their unhappiness. And <laughs> I, that's what I, kind of what I mean about it. It's just, you know, it's not about you, but it's, it is what it is. So I, so I actually went and looked at the document, which you can get online, and it's this long document, but after your confirmation hearing, after they grilled you, um, they submitted written questions to you, and w one of them, one of the senators submitted, I think, over a hundred written questions to you. I think over two hundred, yeah. actually. So. And and did you have to? Did you answer all of them? Yeah, so I ended up getting more. Qu they have this thing called questions for the record that the senators can add. When a hearing's over, they get an opportunity to follow up with written questions, and I got more questions. Um, than Elena Kagan got for, for her Supreme Court nomination. Uh, and I was bound and determined, especially the, one of the senators asked me, the last question one of the senators asked me in this long list of maybe not 200, but with subparts, I think it was over 200 questions, was did you prepare these answers yourself or did someone else prepare them for you? And so I was bound and determined to be able to write and answer that question. I wrote every single word of these answers myself, and so I did. And that was just one senator with the 200. I got a bunch of other, you know, I was hundreds and hundreds of questions. So I just sat at the computer day after day after day, banging out the answers. But you'll see if you, you know, don't, I do not recommend this, but if one were ever to read my responses, uh, which you can also find on the Senate Judiciary Committee website, you will see that a lot of it is just cut and paste verbatim. I give the you know same two paragraphs I cut and paste and I put it in like 19 different answers. Which a lot of their questions were as well. Well, similar enough that I was able to you know cut and paste you know. And do you? I don't know if this is a funny question or a real question. Do you remember the vote in the Senate Judiciary Committee? 
Um, I remember that Senator Sessions voted against me. Seven, 17 to 1. Yeah, so, 17 yeah. to 1. So yeah. even Senator Grassley voted in your favor. Yeah. And nobody gets confirmed. Justice Scalia was confirmed unanimously to yeah. the Supreme Court. Yeah. And you had 16 negative votes against you in the Senate. Yeah. Um, was there any was there any discussion about that, or did they just vote? Do you have any? Well, there was sort of a run up. You know, they they did not. I, if I'm remembering cor correctly, I was one of the few people who was not subject to a cloture vote. They just worked out a deal and proceeded to the to the vote on the floor, and that was a pretty good sign that I didn't have anything to worry about. And so, uh, by the time of the vote, uh, I, I, you know, any, anybody in that position is anxious. I was a little anxious, but <laughs> but you know, it, there wasn't a whole lot to be anxious about in truth at that point. So, and and you were at the White House at that point. Yeah. yeah. So the day you were confirmed. Did you move to the Department of Justice? Next day, yeah. Next day. Yeah, next day. Yeah. And what kind of welcome do you get from the Solicitor General? Uh, you know, the staff. Well, you know, um, I, my first day on the job, I met with my deputies. I called them in and met with my deputies. And as I mentioned earlier, the unbelievable amount of experience in, in this group. And the tenor of the meeting was basically, they, I met with them, asked them some questions, and their answer to every question I asked them was basically, don't you worry your pretty little head, we run everything here. <laughs> and SGs come and SGs go, but we run everything. <laughs> now they said it a little more politely and subtly than that, but that's basically what they said. And you know they're basically right about that. They, you know, they, they have so much knowledge and so much expertise that you, any SG has to rely on them and any SG is lucky to be able to rely on them. They're really amazing lawyers and amazing human beings. And, um, so, so you're in a long line, a tradition of people who've been Solicitor General. It's a, quite a distinguished line. Um, how much communication have you had or did you have uh, with these pro predecessors? A lot, a lot. They've been very, the, my, many, many of my predecessors have been very generous with their time and uh, with their thoughts. And when I got nominated, I tried to talk to all of the former SGs who I could talk to, and I did, and they all were very gracious, and they all gave me a lot of advice about how to do the job. Much of it was in conflict, you know, one with the other. Um, but I, you know, listened to, you know, like one, one of the, my predecessors said, you know, you really ought to identify the top 10 cases and get really involved in those. That was really good advice. Um, and so, you know, there are other pieces of good, really good advice I got from them, and then I also, you know, they're, as I, they're, they are, a lot of them are practicing before the court still, so I interact with them on a regular basis, either as friend or foe, you know, and, and that's quite enjoyable. And then also I'll use them as sounding boards, you know, I've developed a relationship with them and they're really, each one of them is a great person and so I'll call up somebody and say, well, you know, I'm wrestling with this, what do you think, what would you have done? And they're really terrific about having those conversations too. And you've yeah. had that now, I, I guess Paul Clement is, uh, is one of your sure. oh, distinguished sure. yeah. predecessors yeah. and now he's, you argued a case uh, against Paul Clement this year, yeah? Yep. I mean, uh, or this uh, term. Yeah, but I argue uh, multi, uh, at least one case every year with Paul Clement on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes more. And is that this a friendly we'll relationship? Yeah, oh, he's great. He's yeah. a spectacular lawyer and a great advocate, a real gentleman, real professional. He's terrific. Terrific. And did I read correctly that you actually appeared at the Gridiron Dinner? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah? I didn't, like, do a skit or anything. No, I was just sitting there. Yeah, <laughs> just attended the gridiron. You didn't, you didn't make a presentation? No, no, yeah. no, no, no. So when you, were, were there any Supreme Court justices there? I don't remember that okay. there were. I don't yeah. know. I, I, you know, I'm glad I went to the gridiron dinner once. <laughs> but I think I guess, once will, will be planned. I guess I'm wondering, do you run into the justices outside of? Some, some, yeah. You know, it's very, they, you know, they, we have a holiday party, they come to that. They have a holiday party, we go to theirs. <laughs> you see them at various functions, you know, and so you have some social interaction with them. And Elena Kagan was your immediate predecessor. Right, yeah, right. So did you know her pretty well before? Yeah, we worked together some when she was at the department. I got to know her pretty well, I thought. And, and so has she got any advice or has she got to stay out of that? She stays totally out of yeah. it. Totally out of it, yeah. yeah. They, they all do. I mean, you have to be careful, right? It's important. Maintaining the integrity of the process is really, really important. So you just got to be, everybody's very careful about that. They have very warm relationships. I really like all of them uh, on a personal level. And, but you just got to be careful in the way you interact so that you don't do anything that could inadvertently create, you know, a sense that the process is not one that can be uh, relied on. Do you feel less isolated or more isolated as the Solicitor General than when you were General Block, let's say? 
less isolated, I would say, because the, you know, it, the, the, the executive, there's just a whole big giant world that I'm now interacting with that I didn't when I was in private practice. You know, all these great lawyers in the, throughout the executive branch and you know, lawyers in private practice who I'm dealing with on cases. And it's, just, it's a big, you know, I, I'm part of a big world now and it's part of what makes the job so much fun and so stimulating is to be able to interact with all these incredible people all the time. So we're getting close to the end of our time, but I want to ask you a couple of open-ended questions. So what, what's the most fun you've had arguing a case in the Supreme Court? Or have you ever had fun? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> the, So the gene patent case I talked about you know, earlier with Francis Collins, that was really fun. It was really fun. It was just such an interesting question, you know, and it was, a, and we were an amicus, so we only had, a, it was only a 10-minute argument and we had a little bit more leeway because we were amicus. Um, but it was, you know, incredibly interesting question at the intersection of law and the evolution of technology, and it, and you know, it had important ramifications for the future, and it was just really fun. It was just really fun. To and did the court, really interesting. Did the court adopt the position of the yeah? They did follow our bar. Yeah, our, so that fortunately was, enough. That made it feel better. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and private practice, do you have any uh, Grokster and Wiggins? I mean, do you have any other? Well, I was very lucky in private practice. You know, I got I had a sort of a dream career in private practice. I got to do all this great appellate work and really interesting cases. I, I argued a bunch of cases in the court when I was in private practice, and then in other court, you know, federal appellate courts, and had wonderful clients, wonderful range of stuff, incredible colleagues. So I was very lucky in that setting too, and very, very blessed, in, uh, both in that setting and since I've been in the government. So I'm watching the clock here, and so I think we're at the end of our time, but I do have one more question okay. at least, which is, uh, and this is not a statistic that you probably want me to mention, but there have been some Solicitor General who have gone on to be Justices of the Supreme Court. Um, others have not, more have not than have. Yes, many, uh, many, many more have yeah. not. <laughs> So. Seven out of 40 or no, something, five, not five, bad. Five, um, five out of 46. So. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm counting. <laughs> you see how you can have these factual disagreements? And you're gonna, um, what's next for Don Varelli? Uh, well, you know, I'll stay in this job a while longer. It's a wonderful job, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to do it. Then I'm hoping I can take like a six-month sabbatical when I'm done with this job, and then I have no idea. But but you know I don't spend one second thinking about that. I totally in the moment in this job is one of the wonderful things about it. Um, I don't spend one second thinking about what's going to happen after, and I, you know that that'll work itself out. You've been a law teacher, right? You've taught law. How long did you teach it? I've been as a, taught as an adjunct at Georgetown for about 15 years, and that was a lot of fun. I loved that. So if you want to get away from the cold winters in Washington D.C. See, when you're done, the Hastings will have a spot for you. All right, I may take you up on that. I want to say thank you to Don Vrilli and to the audience here. Thank you, thank you very much.